am tempted to believe that so much of what we have understood to be true about stock market averages was only true in a pre-AI world. Welcome to the Rich and Regular Podcast, where we explore life at the intersection of money. I'm Kirsten. And I'm Julian. And today we're talking about the three stories that we believe will shape the way you invest, spend, and earn your money this year, 2024. But before we jump into that, I want to say thank you to, and I apologize already. I'm going to mess this up. I don't know if it's Idiole or, you know, I's and L's kind of look the same way. I think it's Idiole. I read uh, it Idiole. Idiole. That sounds better. <laughs> um, Idiole, who left a five-star review. Um, they said, excited for this new direction. Hi, Kirsten and Julian. I'm so ready to tune into your conversations with others and to continue learning from your insights and reflections on both podcast players and YouTube. Love y'all. Can't wait for this next chapter and to hear all the stories You'll shed light on. We really appreciate that. Um, as a quick reminder, um, there have been several changes, but one of the big ones is that these episodes are not just audio only anymore. And so if you are inclined to want to see what this actually looks like and sounds like at the same time, then you can head over to YouTube. If not, stay where you are. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts are still alive and well. So we really <laughs> appreciate that. And I'm also excited about our conversations. We had our first two this week, we which did. was fun. We did. We will uh, not can't say... Can't wait to drop them. Yeah, we won't share who we... Well, if you follow us on Instagram, you might have heard yeah. We let the cat out the bag, but... Um, yeah, those were really, really great conversations uh, that we are excited to drop later on this year. Um, let's go back in time, though. I want to talk about 2023. Um, for me, I, <laughs> you know, we normally do like a single word to define what it was. And I know I'm throwing you off guard here because we didn't say that we were going to do this, but I've been giving it some thought. And for me, I think it was just a year of rebalancing. And part of that is kind of a nod to investing because there is a little bit of that. And we'll talk about what that means. But for us, it was really a matter of like rebalancing priorities, given so much of what happened in that year or given all of the things that 2023 showed us. It was a crazy year. It was a blur. But if you take a second to think back, if you haven't already watched any of those, you know, blasts from the past, you know, every year ends the with year the whole reviews. year in review. Yeah. You know, in a way, this is kind of what this podcast is about. But I really think that so many things happen that are worthy of mention. We're going to boil those down to three, but I don't want to forget this honorable mention list. I mean, 2023 was the year of bank runs. Yeah. Several uh, big Big bank closures, um, the submarine implosion. Oh, Remember the submersibles? that? The we all learned a new word. That was a thing, <laughs> and um, certainly had uh, conspiracy theorists running amok. There was a wave of both layoffs and strikes, and oh, it was yeah. for me. It was the. It was the. I don't know the word. I'm not a marine guy. I don't know that much about water. But to me, you know, I think I had grown accustomed to these things kind of happening happening in clusters. And this seemed to be like a continuous, constant wave. It was like another big strike, another layoff. And then after a while, it just kind of felt like who is like who's hiring? Mm -hmm. Even though like job numbers were showing very different numbers. It was just weird. Mm -hmm. 2023 was a year of RICO charges. Oh, yeah. We all learned RICO charges. Listen, we all became lawyers. Outside of, <laughs> outside of those of us who are fans of TI, I think everybody else learned what a RICO charge was um, <laughs> in 2023. Um, you cannot forget about or underestimate the impact of the war in Ukraine yeah. and the effect that that had. And now Gaza? Gaza. Uh, the The other sort of I guess on the positive side to that, and it's not necessarily a war, but I mean, it, it, it seemed like the year of Taylor Swift. Oh, and like yeah. when, when people she's her, weren't. She's the time person of the year. Of course. When people weren't talking or thinking about those things, uh, they were either going to a Taylor Swift concert or just came back from seeing Beyonce. Yeah. Like that was pretty much 2023. Yeah. And so we wanted to obviously kind of sift through all of those things and talk about some of the three stories that we think are going to help you guys uh, save, invest, and um, think about money, spend money, whatever it is. But I think there are several things that really happened um, that we should talk about. This is also a little bit of a 
summarization. So for those of you who are also on our email list, if you're not, then shame on you. But we have an email list. There's a link in the bio. We'll put it in both the show notes and the YouTube description. But you know, if you are subscribed, that there is a section there called brain candy. Yeah. And it is like a little intellectual tidbit that we leave in every newsletter. And it basically helps to curate. It's our way of curating all the things that we're seeing and learning and helping you guys think about how it might um, affect your relationship with money, your career, all of the above. And so this is kind of like an audio version of brain candy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, we have the privilege of being able to have a lot of time to read and think. And anytime I come across something interesting or something that I know is impacting people that I, I love and care about, I like to share it. And so I called it brain candy because it was supposed to be this play on your information diet and then also this okay. little treat for reading to the end of the newsletter. And so <laughs> that's where the name comes from. Uh, this episode isn't going to follow that same format, but it is going to talk about some of the patterns that we notice throughout the year and how we're thinking of them, which may jumpstart your own point of view in three different areas. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with number one. Uh, the first one, which has just been really fascinating, is really about stock market performance. Yes. Um, and so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, reflecting on our own experience for the last, I would say, 15 years or so, uh, I would say, is when we made the decision to self-manage our money and to place the majority of our stock market investments in low-cost index funds, right? And so for those of you who don't know what an index fund is, um, well, if you think about what an individual stock is, basically you own a share of a company, uh, a mutual fund, which is basically a way to own tiny slices or shares of a multitude of companies so that you are minimizing your risk. An index fund is a form of a mutual fund where you're basically buying a mutual fund, which has a primary objective of tracking an index. And an index is just a way that stock market analysts try to determine what's happening, how well the stock market is doing. And so the majority of our investments, well over 90%, have been aimed at following some of these primary indexes. Some are total stock markets, some are growth funds, but one of them is certainly the S&P 500. And uh, it's one that we have been spending a lot of time thinking about and talking about. Uh, and this year, uh, for anyone who was invested in the S&P 500 or really any primary broad-based index fund. It's been an amazing year. 2023 was one of those um, amazing years. This was referred to as a rebound year because 2022 was a not-so-great year. And so 2023 was a massive turnaround for the S&P 500. Um, at the time of recording, which is right around the end of December 2023, the S&P 500 is up 22.8. Let's go ahead and round up and call it 23% over the same time last year, and it is around 1.6% away from hitting a new all-time record high. So it's been a really amazing bounce back or rebound year. But I don't think that's actually the most unusual or interesting tidbit with respect to investing. Um, if you think about the history of the S&P 500, it's only posted an annual loss 15 times since it was created in 1957, and nine of those times the index bounced back the following year with a gain, which is inclusive of 2009, which was the rebound from the Great Recession, and 2021, which was the rebound from COVID-19, yeah, basically the shocking the world. Yeah. Um, we talk about this at length in our investing class, Making Money Grow. We specifically refer to the S&P 500, and we go into pretty great detail to help people understand what this means. And so if you want to learn more about that, check out our investing class, Making Money Grow. But what I think makes this bounce back a little different is that it is being driven by seven stocks. These stocks are called the Magnificent Seven, which I am 90% confident is a movie. I feel like, is Denzel in that movie? I don't know. It is a movie. It, and I, I was surprised that Wall Street picked that as the name. They usually get creative and make like an acronym like they did with FANG, which yeah. was Facebook, Amazon, yeah. Apple, Microsoft. Yeah. No, Netflix. Anyway, yeah, I was surprised they picked the Magnificent Seven, but it's just a way for them to highlight concentration or what's driving market. Yeah. So the Magnificent Seven, uh, <laughs> it sounds like I'm talking about a group of superheroes, but the Magnificent Seven are these seven stocks that have driven a 
disproportionate share of the returns for the S&P 500. Basically all of them. In large part, (laughs) why we've seen such a great uh, return from the S&P 500 as a whole. They are Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google, NVIDIA, Meta, which is a parent company of Facebook, Microsoft, and Tesla. What do all of these companies have in common? They are tech stocks, blue chip tech stocks. So here's what that means. Let's talk about the S&P 500 and what the Magnificent Seven have done to essentially contribute to a lot of the value and the gains that we've seen in 2023. So of the 500 companies that are publicly traded, these are some of the best and largest companies that are included in the S&P 500. Those seven, that magnificent seven, those tech stocks jumped around 75% in 2023, and they've contributed over 25% of the S&P's value. Now, the other 493 stocks have not fared so well, right? It's either we're talking about they've been flat year over year or maybe have had modest gains or basically have declined. But if you had stripped the Magnificent Seven out of the way, then the S&P 500, the stock market as a whole, would essentially be flat. So here's a way of kind of thinking about it. And I think, um, you know, I'm thinking about like a dog sled. I've never been on a dog sled. But if you think about a dog sled, which is basically, you know, you got those people who are in a sled. I don't know what you call them. Sledders. And you've got these dogs, right? These huskies. There may be like 10 of them or maybe even more, depending on, you know, the race or the distance, whatever you got to do. But at some point you make a decision about who the lead dog is, right? Who is the who are the dogs that are the big dogs that are leading the pack? And that's a way, I think, uh, thinking about what this Magnificent Seven has done, right? That's not to say that they're literally dragging the others. In some cases, they kind of are. Like, you put those in the back, but they're not necessarily responsible for the pace or the direction or where things are basically going. I think if you need a friendlier version of it, then you can kind of think about uh, Santa and, and his reindeer, <laughs> right? So... We all know who the big dog reindeer is, and that's Rudolph. And then you got, I think it was a Dasher, and I'm looking at my list here, Dasher and Dancer. I don't know what Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, (laughs) and Donner we're doing, right? (laughs) Like, they're they're definitely not leading the pack, right? So this is really (laughs) a way of saying that, like, Rudolph, Dasher, and maybe Dancer are, like, really showing it out here. And He's going to leave Blitzen out. The job done. You know, the the, the names get weirder as you can (laughs) A little further on, but I hope people get the point that I'm making. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying is the the thing that's unique about this bounce back is the market concentration. And market concentration has always been a thing. There have always been big companies that account for a very large share of an index's value and they change over time. They're called blue chip stocks, like you said. And if you had asked us 10 years ago what the blue chip stocks were, we would have said Netflix and yep. Best Buy. Like yep. that's how often they change. So the companies at the top, the concentrated companies, the the R- Rudolphs and <laughs> Donners or whatever you said, the Rudolphs are always changing. And if you invest in index funds, it's done automatically on your behalf. Yep. But what's different about this time is that even with that understanding, the top seven in the S&P don't typically account for 25, upwards of 30% of the market's value. And so naturally there's a lot of theories and hand wringing as to like why this is so different and what shareholders should make of it. Yeah. And without getting into speculation and showing all of the theories, I just want to talk about the two that really resonated with me. That's what people say when they're about to get into it. I know. Because it's only speculation if you're... (laughs) Well, it's only speculation if you're wrong. Oh, okay. It's analysis if you're correct. (laughs) Well, the two theories about why this is happening that resonated with me are kind of two sides of the same coin. The first one is that this is just a return to their normal valuation. So if you zoom out to last year, 2022, these are the same companies that people sold off. Meta stock fell something like 65%. Amazon ended the year at 49% in 2022, and three of the seven haven't even returned to where they were in 2021 yet, and they may not get there. And so the theory is that this is just a return to their previous valuation. And if you own these stocks prior to 2023, you're just seeing your portfolio return back to where it was. And if you were investing last year, if you were dollar cost averaging and still contributing to your 401k, you look like a genius because you got a major discount on all of these stocks, which, you know, cool, cool, cool. I'm not mad at that. So the first one is just that, oh, this is just a return to where they were. Now, the second one is 
based on something you pointed out, that these are all tech companies and that this growth is fueled by AI. Yep. All of these companies are involved in AI one way or another, and there is a large belief that AI is transformational. So these companies who were all early movers are just now being rewarded by the market for having rolled out or acquired their way to having robust AI tools. Yep. Microsoft was a huge investor in open AI. Google just rolled out their tool. And so the other idea is that this is this is the market's response to AI. This is how excited people are about it. Where do you fall? Do you have you thought about why these seven stocks are doing so well? I have and I think I have fallen more so in the latter category, um, or at least I am very tempted to place myself in the latter category where I am tempted to believe that so much of what we have understood to be true about stock market averages was only true in a pre-AI world. Mm. Um, and I am not saying that to pressure or influence anyone's you know investment decisions, I'm at this interesting point in my life where I've been investing for over two decades now, and I've been embedding myself and learning so much about how all of this stuff works. And I've seen and going through so many downturns and rebounds that this one does admittedly feel a little different, especially when you think about the stock market in the broader context of the economy, like literally during a time where so many things were going wrong, we've seen almost like an equal and opposite response with the stock market. And, and as an investor, like that is a very exciting opportunity. And so I'm tempted to think like, when you start to see to your earlier point around this rebalancing and the extent of the total market that is being driven by tech stocks, and you start to see AI and you start to hear interviews like the CEO of Google basically saying that artificial intelligence is akin to the discovery of fire with respect to the impact that it might have on humanity, I am prone to just believe them at this point because yeah. I have certainly alive and hesitant during the days where some of these initial big technological advances were born. I benefited from them as a consumer significantly more. And now I'm benefiting from them as a consumer and as an investor. So I think I lean more so towards the end, but either way you slice it, this to me strengthens why we invest and why we advise other people to invest the way that we do, which is passively. So many things could happen, right? Like there are, for every amazing technological advancement, there are probably dozens that you will never hear about because they just sort of were either flash in the pan or they were just complete duds. And there's no real way for anyone to effectively pay attention and make smart decisions while paying attention to all of the details, while all of these things are happening. Not to mention the incentive that companies and leaders and investors have from withholding information so that you can't accurately or effectively time the market. And so this is one of the reasons why we recommend people are or should become passive investors versus becoming um, active investors. Um, and again, we talk about that. If you're not sure what that means, we talk about that and explain what that means in our investing class, making money grow. But then, of course, a few of the other reasons is just, you know, as an investor, minimizing risk and wanting to make sure that we aren't disproportionately placing so much of our wealth in the hands or trusting in the leadership or any of these companies to actually fulfill some of these grandiose visions that they have. And then lastly, there's just the role of cost, right? It is significantly more affordable, which has a huge impact on our value over the long run in terms of our portfolio performance. And so, um, yeah, I mean, AI is, is a major, major, uh, I think, game changer, and it has implications. And we'll talk a little bit more about the broader implications later, but with respect to the stock market. And I think it's one of the reasons why so many of these companies are having such amazing stock market performance in such a short period of time. But I think when we go back to a few of the theories that you mentioned um, as you were speaking, I think there are just a couple of ways that you can interpret this. One is you can either choose to believe that this market performance is really just mirroring the underlying economy. Right. So there's just like so much of what's going on. And this just is, it could just be like, this is what it is, right? Yeah. Like if this, you were not a big company worth trillions you're not of dollars, have, it was a hard year. Correct. Just like in America, like the American people, if you were not already rich, correct, you might've had a rougher year in 2023 than 
a lot of people. Yeah. So it could be that this is just what the new normal is. Like I was saying, like in a world of AI, there are some companies, some corners of the market that just have embedded advantages and as a result are able to reap the benefit of that far greater than others who just aren't. Um, the other way of looking at it, which I think is a slight tweak, is that this is a bit of a precursor of what's to come, which is to say, as AI becomes more thoroughly widespread and embraced by other companies, which oftentimes make people say, well, what is a tech company anyway, right? Like if everyone is using and including or incorporating AI into their business operations to create more efficiencies and then what technically makes a tech company, a tech company, if everybody's doing it. I think whatever your interpretation of any of this stuff is, from an investing standpoint, it has a tendency to affect the decisions that you make and it affects your risk tolerance. Ultimately, it boils down to a, a very simple decision. You either choose to be a little bit more conservative, which is to say, I don't really know, and therefore I'm not willing to place my bets you know, disproportionately in these particular areas, or you say, actually, I believe it. And as a result, I'm willing to bet that this is going to have an incredible effect on my stock market portfolio. And so I'm going to place a disproportionate share of my wealth and my investing dollars and my, to use a gambling reference, I'm going to put my cards or my chips on these types of stocks. Yeah. I mean, I, I completely agree. People who tend to look at the market as just a mirror of the broader economy, generally speaking, tend to be more conservative and people who tend to look at it as a sneak peek for what's to come tend to be more aggressive. Yeah. At the end of the day, one year performance isn't sufficient enough time to come to a conclusion about your own investments and how they're performing over time. But this is a good time to look at your 401ks and the rest of your portfolio to see how they performed against the index. If your portfolio returned over 20%, then congratulations, you outperformed the market as a whole. If it returned under 20%, then you underperformed the market. And if it returned right around that 20% range, then you were on par. Now, keep in mind that 20% returns are not the norm for total stock market no, returns. And again, they haven't been. Yeah, this is just one year. So wherever you fall, you need to zoom out and ensure you're not making some rash decision in an attempt to chase a result or predict an outcome. Come, but you should definitely at least look because we remember when we were investing with financial advisors and we were kind of hands off with our investments, we would be hearing about the spectacular year that the markets had and then be looking and see that most of our investments were in the 493 and not in the magnificent seven of that time. And so it's a great time to look. And regardless of what your market ideology is, these results are going to set the tone for 2024, which is why we're talking about them. The details absolutely matter. And we have to move past the point of just being satisfied with not losing money and work to understand how well our investments are performing relative to something else. And so that will give you a better idea of what's possible. You can make the necessary changes to your financial goals. Yeah, I completely agree. So take that moment. It's the end of the year. Maybe it's the beginning of the new year to look back. Um, we just gave you basically the benchmark, what you should be comparing your portfolio performance too. So the S&P 500 is a widely used and relevant metric to compare what your portfolio has done to Kirsten's point that will help you to understand whether or not you are underperforming or on par. And then I think, you know, you owe it to yourself to maybe listen to this podcast, conduct your own research on what's happening with these tech stocks, and then think about what you want your portfolio to look like for the foreseeable future. Um, let's move on to the second big story of 2023, and it's really around fintech and consumer spending. So now we're looking at basically the other side of the balance sheet. We're looking into debt and we're looking at the cash going out. Um, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, I think certainly when you think about the uh, the American wallet or pocketbook, if you will, especially in 2023, and you think about kind of the blockbuster things that really just kept people swiping, you know, it was like, 
what was it? Oppenheimer. There was a Barbie was a big moment. I think we already mentioned Taylor Swift and Beyonce. Beyonce. Like these were like behemoth. I mean, these were industries in and of themselves. Morgan that, Stanley mm, said this is why we have the soft landing yeah. because consumer spending was so strong. Like those things, like our insatiable appetite to be entertained, regardless of how hot the world is getting, is ultimately what saved the world. So kudos to you, America. <laughs> Great job for, like, refusing to not be entertained while everything is falling <laughs> apart and uh, leave the world behind. But anyway, we can talk about that for another time. With all of that said, you would have to have been living under a rock to have not heard around how all of this translated to this incredible rise in credit card spending. So a couple of interesting statistics just to kind of help us look back and um, assess the damage. So this was just like after Q2. There were reports that were coming out saying that we had hit uh, record levels of credit card debt and it surpassed $1 trillion. And if the balance wasn't enough, that financial institutions and credit card companies were tweaking the interest rates. And so the average APR had basically climbed to a point where it was around 30% higher than the prior year. I think it's one thing to talk about the role that credit card plays just in the overall personal financial picture. Um, but when you start to think about that and inflation and student loan payments kind of coming back and this wave of layoffs and you combine all of those things. Like, I think any reasonable person would say like, this is a cause for concern. And even still to our earlier point, we saw like a reflection of either uh, ambivalence or ignorance or whatever you want to call it. But like, we were still spending. And I think what we don't talk enough about is like, where is this money coming from? And the answer, I think, that a lot of people are, aren't are quite saying, but I think we're willing, willing to say, is buy now, pay later, right? Like, we basically created a new lending market or made it easier for this new lending market to blossom, which basically allowed people to buy things that they don't have the money for and enjoy them today. And it would exist alongside the standard credit market that we have. And that has, in many ways, propped up or enabled so many people to continue to consume the way they have, to spend the way that they have. And I think that's something that we really, really need to pay attention to. So if you don't know what buy now, pay later is. Um, it's probably because you don't do a lot of online shopping. It's not in stores. For sure. Yes. For sure. You can't walk into a store and say, can I, can, <laughs> can I, I get this can now? buy this now and pay later? Yeah, that's called stealing. If you are... <laughs> If you are a, a big online shopper, this is basically where you've seen it. And maybe you've even seen it, but you didn't quite know what it was. But as you went down to your payment option, you may have noticed there was like this new little bubble yeah. that you could that you could click on. And it's, uh, you know, a firm or a few of these other companies that basically say, or you can hit this button and you can enjoy it now. But basically, it's like this new digital version of Layaway, but, but even better. Because you can take it home with you now. Like yeah. you don't even have to worry about waiting until you make your installments based on the deal. You can basically walk away with it now. Um, it is a little more flexible. It usually comes with 0% interest for an introductory period of time. Like it is a really, really sweet deal. There are variable interest rates, which, you know, depending on how you look at it can be an if issue. If you want or longer not. time. Yeah. And, and you've got the ability or the flexibility to have these longer term payment plans, which again, credit cards don't typically offer you. This new form of payment was so wildly popular in this year, particularly the buy now, pay later use was up 47% on Black Friday and up 43% on Cyber Monday this year. You know, I think while this may sound impressive compared to credit cards, it's actually like pretty tiny, yeah. right? Um, which is why I think so many people aren't really pointing the finger or the blame at buy now, pay later. But I do think it, it played a role in so much of the continued sense of normalcy that we've seen um, in terms of people spending. So the thing about buy now, pay later is they're technically small relative to credit card companies, but they are positioning themselves basically to be the new king of the castle. Yeah, the new version. The new version of credit. In some ways, they even think of themselves as the anti-credit card, even yeah. though they offer similar benefits. I think it's smart. 
It's 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 an interesting <laughs> wordplay, but I I don't know. I, I don't get that feeling. Yeah, I know. The Affirm CEO, uh, his name is Max Levchin. Here's what he had to say about it. He says, uh, and I quote, you know exactly what you're going to pay. You know exactly what the schedule for payment is. And there will be no late fees under any circumstances. So I think it's sort of the exact opposite in many ways. It does serve the same purpose. You get to pay for things right now or over time. So this is his remarks yeah. with respect to the role that buy now, pay later plays and how it differs or in some cases is better than or competes with credit card companies. Yeah, we we did an episode on this a while ago and outlined all of the pros and cons of this technology. And me and Julian were kind of on two different sides of the argument. It sounded Sounds a lot. Like you still are. <laughs> yeah. But I do get the appeal of of buy now, pay later because credit card math is really hard to understand. Yeah. And with buy now, pay later, what you owe is very clear. And these services actually fill a gap and kind of expand credit to people who need it, but may not have access to it for whatever reason. Yeah. But the thing that we do agree on, even if we don't necessarily agree on the viability of this technology, what we do agree on is that we both understand that these are loans. They're just short-term installment loans in the same way that Airbnb is still renting. It's just a short-term lease instead of a year-long one. You're still responsible. Yeah. What I like about Buy Now, Pay Later is it's the kind of AI-driven, quick and easy access to credit that tech optimists have been promising. So it's like from the future. However, to your point and to your to your concerns, it's not as risk free as it sounds. If you're late or you miss a payment or you need more than just the four courtesy installments, those fees come at you hard and fast. And they're kind of up there with like payday loans and, and other predatory lending sources. Yes. But the reason that we're bringing this up is because every year around this time, I get a little speculative about the future of retail. And in 2022, I said that the spoils of 2023 would go to shoppers who planned, who were proactive and who price checked because we could see how corporations were playing with pricing. Well, for 2024, I think that the savviest shoppers are going to be people who understand how corporations are handling pricing still and people who understand their payment options because now you have options. And if you can acknowledge that this is still debt, even if you're not paying interest, you can actually buy yourself some more time, yeah. which is valuable because there's a big difference between spending money you don't have and spending money you don't have yet. And I think that latter market of people who know the money's coming, it's just not here yet, has been underserved and I've been waiting for FinTech to catch up. And actually, according to Statista Research, that's actually how people are using it. Only 13% of people are opting to pay in longer installments for a fee, but most of the people are using just the advantage of the four installments and breaking up the payment. Okay. If you think about a lot of the debt that we hear about from people, it's not because they were spending recklessly. It's because an expense came in and disrupted their cash flow. Yeah. And so this option, again, allows you to buy yourself some more time and get your cash flow sorted without necessarily impacting your credit score or paying those high interest fees. And it's expanding. It's still mostly online, but it used to just be for small purchases. In November of 2023, Amazon rolled out a pay later for businesses, which is interesting. If you're approved, you can pay for an Amazon purchase in equal installments over three to 48 months. It's not 0% interest like the traditional buy now layer, but they're claiming that there's no hidden or late fees and then we're also seeing it in healthcare and we're seeing it in furniture, any sort of major purchase, you're seeing this more of as, as an option. Yeah. So I just have no reason to believe that this is going to slow down in 2024. And I think people who may have ignored it or it may have been unfamiliar might find themselves giving it a shot. If you're, if you're going to use it, just, you know, come up with some rules and some boundaries for yourself because it is, it's a slippery slope. Listen, I have two thoughts whenever I think about buy now, pay later. The first one is the mafia. It just kind of makes me feel like uh, a deal. What a guy who's like, I oh, don't worry about it. I got you. Like it, 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 it's giving it when you're ready. It's giving me number running vibes. Um, and, and again, listen, totally speculative here. Um, and the second version or the second thing that I think about with respect to buy now, pay later is like an experimental drug. Yeah. It's like I am in pain. And it's like, look, I, I got this thing that we, we we could do this and it's up to you. You know, if it goes bad, it's going to be really, really bad. But if you're willing to take it, you know, it might work out. This might be the thing. 
And um, I, I think that's how I that's how I view it. I in, at this point in my life have no use for it. I'm certainly not interested. But to your point, I think it is here to stay. I, I think it is a new financial and technological advancement. And so I admit that part of my rejection is because my original blueprint and programming of money did not include this world. Yeah. And so it's very new to me. And it's like, what do you mean? There's just an entirely different lending market that is- What do you mean I don't need a piece of plastic that exists to borrow money? That of everything that I know to be true. And so I think there's a little bit of that. Uh, I think it's also, um, you know, to use a metaphor, it's a bit of a specialized tool. And so everyone I'm sure out there has some version of a toolkit and you know what goes in that toolkit. I think buy now, pay later is not the standard thing. It's not a hammer or a screwdriver. It's like a needle nose plier. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a very specific <laughs> thing that you might not necessarily need. You could use it for a couple of other things, but it's not a everyday kind of tool that I think people need to be using. But I think what is more interesting and dare I say concerning to me is the role that buy now, pay later plays in our consumer and our debt culture, because now we are making it even easier for people to consume and experience something without having the funds that they need to actually purchase it. And my concern is really around what that does to the psyche of yeah. Americans in a world where we are bombarded with temptation, right? Like this ultimately catches up to you at some point if you don't have a plan. And we already know that based on the existing system, far too many people don't have a good grip on managing their debt. And so to now create a new world that could exacerbate that issue, I think, is a little bit concerning. Um, if you want to do a deep dive, uh, we did go deeper into this subject. It's episode 64 of the Rich and Regular podcast. So you can go back into the caverns of the archives, into the 60s, uh, and learn a little bit more about that then. Um, but I think now's a good time to move on to the third big yeah. story that we think um, is going to shape the way that you think about money in 2024. <laughs> All right. So you heard it here. It is still debt. So you do owe those people. And if you're already in a hole, don't keep digging. But it is also a tool that you can take advantage of if you have planned and prepared accordingly. All right. So the last trend is about AI and the future of work. And you see this is like a through line of <laughs> AI is in every story. Um, but I want to ground us with some data first because Pew Research did a study in 2022 on AI and hiring and evaluating workers and found that six in 10 Americans believe that AI would have a major impact on workers, generally speaking, but only 28% believe that it would have a major effect on them personally which is just a very American wow. way of uh I am not thinking. surprised by that, yeah, but okay. It'll affect everybody else, wow. but not me. Of course. And then when asked if they would apply for a job with an employer that used AI to help make hiring decisions, almost two thirds said no, primarily because they know that AI will treat people more equally, but they feel like AI would struggle to see the potential in humans and wouldn't give a chance to people who didn't fit neatly within the descriptions which was another interesting stat. But the other one that I found most intriguing, the majority of American adults, about six in 10, say that they have heard nothing about the ways AI systems can be used in the hiring process or for evaluating employees. And the difference in that awareness was associated with people's answers about the subject. So if you were more informed about AI, yeah. you were more likely to believe that it would have an impact on you, generally speaking and personally, than if you had not heard anything about AI. Yeah. So this goes back to the idea of an information diet shaping the way that you see the world. Here's where it gets really good. Pew did another study in August of 2023 and found that 90%, the vast majority of Americans, say they've heard at least a little bit about artificial intelligence, but their ability to identify specific uses of the technology was still developing, and only 30% of people could recognize the six examples of AI in their everyday life. So things like the product recommendations that you see on Amazon, or the alert that you get from your security camera that there's an unrecognized person. Yeah. So by 2023, not only were Americans more aware of AI, probably because of the run-up and all the, the news, but they still couldn't identify that it was already here. It was like, yeah, I've heard about it. I know it's coming. Yeah. But 
in the list of things that they said, well, do you recognize it? It was like, nah, I didn't think that was AI. I thought that was just something else. Yeah. Um, wow. Wow. That is, uh, that is alarming um, and, and concerning, but also not surprising. Right. Um, and it also, uh, no pun intended, affirms uh, that... <laughs> That's the nerdiest thing what? I've said in a long time. <laughs> um, and if you got that one, shout out to you. Uh, but that that affirms uh, that my suspicions, which is that I live in a completely, I live in a bubble. I very <laughs> clearly live in a bubble. Um, I am admittedly far more uh, aware than, let's say, according to the research, the vast majority of Americans. And um, I am arguably a little bit more concerned uh, than, than most people are. But But that's okay. Um, hopefully this episode will help get more of us there. I think just in this particular episode, we've spoken about the role that AI has played in basically driving stock market performance post pandemic. We've spoken about the role that it plays in the creation of what will likely be a trillion dollar market. Very yeah. New quickly. lending market. It's just a question of how long that's going to take, but like AI is basically expediting that growth, um, and will recreate you know, the credit lending market that we know to exist right now, most likely in a fraction of the time. And to now know, which to no surprise that is playing and will likely continue to play a role in what that interview process looks like. I mean, you just think about the number of managers that we know that are stressed out in that process and are looking for an easy button. Without question, I think we know that AI is going to play a role if it hasn't already. And with that comes biases and unfortunate um, consequences. Um, but above and beyond all of that, I think when you just think about people who work for publicly traded companies, I think of AI as a job killer, period. <laughs> it, it, it just is. And anyone, especially that is an entrepreneur that has leveraged AI can tell you that, yeah, it is a life changer because it, it you know, there are AI tools that save you a lot of money. So all of that to say, for those of you uh, who are listening to this podcast, um, I, I hope that we can offer a couple of tips to help you excel in this new world, uh, whether you see it or can identify it, um, AI, artificial intelligence will impact you in some way if yeah, it already has not. It's either going to affect the types of jobs that are available. So it may not take down the quantity, but right. it will take down the quality of jobs. And it's definitely going to impact the way that we're hired or get interviewed, like to believe yeah. that it's not going to impact each of those areas in the job search feels a little bit like you're in denial. Yeah. yeah. So, so a couple of things that I would say, um, and I feel like I'm stitching together several episodes of previous podcasts that we've done, but I think one for sure is a matter of making yourself a little bit more competitive and making sure that these tools can identify you in a way that actually works in your favor. And so the first thing that I would recommend and strongly recommend for a lot of people uh, is to prune and or refine your online presence. I hope I'm not asking you to create an online presence, but I certainly know there are some of us who live offline and might be underestimating the role that this might play and how attractive of a candidate you might be. And so if you're one of those people who don't have a LinkedIn page, um, I strongly advise that you have one. If you're one of those people who have one and you don't really spend a lot of time there, I strongly recommend that you reevaluate that decision. And there are tons of AI tools that can help you think about what you can do, what you might write or post about all of those things. At least make sure your profile is filled out. If you, sure. if you haven't filled out your profile in a couple of years, you need to go back in there because they've sure. added some stuff for and sure. you've got some blanks and you need to fill those in so that it's a complete profile. For sure. And then secondly, I would say um, let 2024 be the year that you commit to building your AI literacy, yes. right? So if you've come into the beginning of this episode, you've been listening for this long and you're still learning things, I'm glad that we could help introduce this as an area of interest for you, we hope that you can kind of take that to the next level. There's an article from Business Insider that basically reported on specific AI skills that can lead to a pay bump. And so as I think about all of the different companies that may be hiring, I can assure you, you're going to see AI as a tool, your comfort, your ability to understand it, all of those things are going to be that much more important for you. So whether it's your ability to automate a spreadsheet or, you know, create customer emails and generate quick 10 questions or creative design or whatever it is, you need to be literate and able to use those tools to help make yourself a better candidate or to help put yourself in a position to earn more income. Whether you like it or not, this is the world that we live in and they're not 
introducing it anymore. It is now officially here. Yes. If you're still employed, you can look into using your professional development budget if you have one to get a certification or take an online course that boosts your knowledge. Now, if you're looking for a job, you can actually use AI to help you. There are tools that will auto apply to hundreds or even thousands of jobs at a time, like Lazy Apply or Simplify, which are both just browser extensions that you would put in your Chrome or whatever browser that you use that save you from having to copy and paste a hundred times because that's the thing that just really slows up the process. And sometimes if you don't have a network to break into a new field or to reinvent yourself career wise, finding a job just becomes a numbers game. And these tools help you hit those numbers without spending all day doing like demoralizing. Yeah you know, copy, paste, drag and drop work. So as with all things, use AI in your search with moderation. It's great to have a robot help you write your resume or your cover letter or fill out your LinkedIn, but you don't want it to sound like a robot wrote it for you. Right. And, you know, depending on how you use what you prompt it with, it does very much give robot. Yes, it does. So use it as a tool, but make sure you add that human touch to it. Uh, and speaking of that human touch, we would certainly appreciate if you left us a five-star review. Oh, well played. Just go into the podcast <laughs> rating section, swipe down, hit that fifth star, leave us a five-star rating and a review. I hope this is the best year you've ever had. I hope you make a lot of money. I hope you earn a lot more money. And I hope you boost your investing rate this year to help you get closer to achieving your financial goals. We will see you guys next time. If you like videos like this and want to see more, make sure you click subscribe and turn on notifications.